from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, Resplendent in Rose, movies working out, why we care so much about the liturgy, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. All righty, put your hand on the radio. The Catholic Underground is right here. It's uh, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent, at least we like to think so. It's episode number 261. I am Father Chris Decker. If you were listening to us live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on in the chat room, as a few of you, in fact, are. Joining me this week, we got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. He's now in high definition. Look at him. <laughs> Bask at him on the video feed. <laughs> We've also got Kathleen Lee. She is a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge, and she is our semi-pro. Uh, you might be getting your certificate in Faith Ninja. Soon. Soon. It is to come. That's right. Uh, also, Jeff Blackwell, the technical director of the CU. He is the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. Hello, Jeff. Howdy, hello, neighbor. All righty. And Mary Kate Taylor is our disembodied video director for the live stream. She joins us uh, from from actually another rip in the space-time continuum. Uh, hello, Mary Kate. Howdy. And of course, I hope that you saw Rose today, not with your colored glasses, but uh, but on your clergy and perhaps in the sanctuary. It is Latare Sunday. And uh, it's a little bit uh, like Advent, you know, when we ra- wear rose, uh, mm-hmm. Kathleen, but but this is during Lent. Did you see rose today, Kathleen? I didn't. I was on retreat, and we were in the middle of the woods in Pineville, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suspect that they may not have had uh, vestments available in the rose color. <laughs> Ain't no rose in Pineville. No. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. Uh, Shout Father, out to all our Pineville people. Father Ron, did you wear rose today? You know I did. Of course you did. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, uh, How could I not? Actually, the only reason I can wear rose is because Father Ryan gave me for my ordination present a rose vestment. Wow. And I haven't had deal with it. <laughs> deal with all that. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to uh, to get another one. So, Father, what's the reason for the rose? Well, the the third Sunday of Advent and the fourth Sunday of Lent are like little islands of joy in the midst of a long season of penitence. And so, of course, traditionally, as we know, Lent was much, much more uh, challenging than it is now. Originally, Lent started three weeks before, three Sundays before Ash Wednesday, uh, and that would be you'd wear purple and you'd start to do some of the liturgical things like removing the glory and the hallelujah. And so by the time you got to the fourth Sunday of Lent, where you had been fasting daily, not just two or three times, but every single day, where there had the organ had been shut down and turned off, mm. where flowers had been forbidden in the church, by the time you got there, you were seven weeks in and you were going, come on. <laughs> and so this was kind of one last little boost. The organ could be turned back on, flowers could be put in the church. And uh, and the idea was this was going to give you a booster shot, like one little kind of a dose to get you ready to go. Because next Sunday, we veil the statues. Next That's Sunday, right. we enter into what was called Passion Tide, where we're, we're going to get really focused on on kind of the, the sadness and the tragedy of the crucifixion and make ourselves ready for Holy Week. And so this was kind of the last way station, the last, you know, it's got a little bit like the, uh, the, the Lost Lorien, so to speak. You stop in, you get your little recharge, and then you're going into Mordor. You know, it's, 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 a, it's an island of joy in the midst of a tough season. In fact, uh, we even see that in in the midst of the liturgy with the introit. Uh, did did you actually you do the mass propers, and so you actually had the that uh, that introit that says "Rejoice Jerusalem," correct? At the traditional Latin mass, we did. At the yeah. other masses, we did. We haven't gotten to doing the propers just yet. Um, we do some of them at some of the masses, but uh, but it's sadly today I didn't do the traditional mass. Father Travis did, and so I didn't get to hear it. It was sad. Oh well, you know. Very sad. Yeah. Jeff, did you see yeah. Rose vestments today? Oh, Jeff I did not. Um, which I, I'm, 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 I was confused whether this was the third Sunday or fourth Sunday of Lent. This is four. Four, okay. Four of your Earth weeks. But no, okay. uh, and um, and I usually uh, pick up on that, but uh, because I, you know, I see in color, uh, and it was purple today. <laughs> Most of the time. Least, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Jeff sees in beautiful Technicolor. <laughs> Mary Kate, uh, did you see rose vestments today? Uh, you know, I did not actually. Yeah. Um, we had purple vestments today, yeah. which, of course, a- is the option. You know, that, that's the thing. It, I, I know uh, in in the Ordo and and Father for for our listeners, the Ordo is that 
great little book that tells us all of the secrets of uh, of how we're supposed to be saying the mass. You know, the the different options that we have, the readings, a little uh, a little pastiche of the readings, just in case you want to to in case you are really stuck for something in your homily. Um, <laughs> but rose rose is listed as an italicized thing. Ah. In in the ordo, it's it's an option. So right. uh, nowadays in in the Novus Ordo. Uh, purple is generally the, just throughout all of Lent, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah. So this is really kind of a, a neat thing, as I was telling my parishioners, because it is, as you say, a way station. It is an oasis just to get us through what's going to be. Uh, if again, if you're spiritually living the disciplines of Lent, even though we don't start it seven weeks before, um, it's helpful. The church still allows Latari Sunday because we do need something to launch us into uh, to Palm Sunday. And, uh, and I think it's a very, very helpful and useful thing. Um, so, Kathleen, did you ever think about, about Letare Sunday, this, this Sunday of, of Lent being kind of that, that uh, diving board, if, as you will? No. Um, you know, I had always known that we have a, a Rose Sunday, you know, during Lent. But actually, one of my favorite parts of Scripture is, was in the readings today, and that's from the second reading at the very end when it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It's like, okay, Lent has been a time of, for me, this is what it said to me, you know, Lent has been a time of, of you know, kind of death and simplicity and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and kind of a slumber. And now it's like, okay, get to work. Like, we got stuff to do. Good things are coming. Yeah. Um, so it was, it's my, one of my favorite. And I also like, I also like the fact that, um, that this is traditionally the, the Sunday that, um, if you're doing the scrutiny, certainly, but, uh, but in year A, it's the, the man born blind. Mm-hmm. And so this is one of those last opportunities for us to open up our eyes and to not be like the Pharisee who had Jesus standing right there in front of him and right. still couldn't see him and to say, okay, uh, in, in my Lenten penances and where I, where I am with, how am I doing with that? Have I, have I shut my eyes and said, well, I'm just going to kind of uh, sit here and and do whatever I want and wait for Easter, or am I really going to give it the spiritual discipline that it deserves? And so this is this is the opportunity to do it. Um, yeah, I I like Latari Sunday, also because it plays with the mind of my parishioners because they don't they're like what uh, it w- that was purple last week, you know? Well, yeah. so. Why are you wearing that pink robe? That's right. Why why the pink robe? Father well, never wears pink. Yeah. No, he wears a robe. Real priests wear robes. <laughs> <laughs> I may have lace that. on, but that doesn't mean I'm wearing pink. That's right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Father Ryan has some very beautiful lace surplices yeah. and albs. They're I great. love them. I love. I love that. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's great. possible to go too far. I have one that looks more like a negligee than it does an alb, and I I rarely wear it because it really is quite ridiculous. <laughs> you know, totally it's, uh, went there. <laughs> it's, it's a little extreme. Yeah. So uh, so before we go into that, and before we go much deeper, we thought it might be a good lighthearted way on this Latare Sunday to start the show by reviewing just a few of the books and a few of the movies that, that are out that, that we've seen, uh, some that I haven't seen but I've read a lot about, you know. Um, and, and for that, we turn to our, to our shallot-like uh, correspondent, Father Ryan Humphreys, who, uh, who really, despite the fact that you're in a very busy parish, you almost always have uh, an opportunity to sneak out to, uh, to go see a movie. Well, I've had fewer opportunities for movies. Most of the time, I end up catching them on DVD. Yeah. I do have a good bit of time for reading, um, mostly because I'm in the confessional a lot, uh, about five to six hours a week. And so, you know, I just don't have that many parishioners. And so I have a lot of time to use my Kindle Paperwhite, trademark, uh, and, and enjoy, uh, enjoy some good books. But I did get a chance to, to, uh, to see and get a hold of Noah, a movie that I uh, expected to hate. And uh, and I was planning on hating with basically my whole soul. It was going to be delicious, and it turns out the hatred was thick, delicious, like a like a milkshake. It like was a, a horrible pudding. movie, and I hated every every second of it. Wow. Yeah. I, I wish he would just tell us how he really yeah. felt about it. Yeah. <laughs> Father Ryan sugarcoats everything. <laughs> you should know that by now. You know, it it was one of these movies where I was nervous because we had talked about it. I said, well, you know, maybe they're gonna, you know, maybe they're gonna just in a subtle way kind of replace the, the, the an impetus for the movie by saying, well, it's not about sin and it's about something else. And then maybe they're going to maybe take away Noah's heroism. Um, and everything was, in fact, much worse than I expected. Um, the movie as a movie, <laughs> if, if I was not a practitioner of Christianity, I'd probably watch it and go, oh, this is fun. You know, I mean, it, 
if there was a movie about about Hindu uh, faith that did this, I would probably laugh as I did. Uh, in fact, there's a movie called um, Oh, The Last Shaolin about the great Chinese epic monkey, and I laughed hysterically as they made fun of those people's culture. Not laughing so much anymore. In this case, there are weird fallen angels who are somehow rock monster creature elf dwarf gnome things. Whoa. Um, this that, is right up Mary Kate's alley. Uh, and smoke. Yeah, they actually <laughs> build the ark. They're sort of angels and sort of not. And then you have the fact that it wasn't because of sin. It was just that God really wanted to destroy the world. Oh. oh. Yeah, just for funsies. Good and old fact, Gnosticism. Noah, Noah at some point goes, you know, maybe we should just go ahead and all kill ourselves. If God wants to destroy the world, maybe I should just commit suicide and kill my family while I'm at it. Huh. Um, uh, you know, of course, there's Emma Watson over there going, that'd be a bad idea. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that the bad guy sneaks onto the boat for no apparent reason, because God apparently didn't cover all his bases. Uh, it, it just, everything about this movie is God-awful. Uh, and and just God-awful. And it is the most sinister, evil thing of taking the story of creation, twisting it, robbing it of all of its intellectual meaning, all of its spiritual meaning, and then packaging it as a religious movie. And, and it is, it is, it's just horrific. I, I, I cannot say enough bad things about that movie. You lost me at Rock Monsters. Well, and I saw uh, Father Jonathan uh, Morris, Jonathan Morris uh, on uh, 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 TV, I guess it was last weekend, and he, mm -hmm. he had already seen the, uh, uh, you know, I guess it was a pre-release of the movie. He said that it really did not ever, they didn't use the word God in there anywhere. They did use the word creator. Oh, uh, right. With a lowercase c. Yeah, but. Uh, God is mostly mostly Gaia is really oh, what it is. It's oh. it's that kind of that earth principle, mother earth kind of principle. That's mostly who God is. You mean an earth princess. <laughs> but I, I know there's been a, there, there, there was a lot of um, uh, talk about, uh, you know, Christians who were, who were coming out saying it's not really. Um, it's not an accurate portrayal of, of the story. And as I understand it, it's a pretty short story. Mm -hmm. But I, I heard uh, Radio Ad a couple of times this week uh, in the pre-release, um, and there was a story that appeared in the L.A. Times, and Paramount decided to put a disclosure in the radio ads. I don't huh. know if it was on TV, but uh, and the guy read it in a low voice. I'll try to do it. Uh, the film is inspired by the story of Noah. While artistic license has been taken, we believe that this is true to the essence, values, and integrity of a story that is a uh, cornerstone of the faith for millions of people worldwide. The biblical story of Noah can be found in the book of Genesis. 90 days, same as cash. Mormons need not apply. With approved credit. <laughs> lies! All <laughs> lies! <laughs> well, I haven't seen it yet, but I really don't want to now. I know. I, well, you know, and okay. Um, maybe, maybe Mary Kate would be with me on this, but... I'm okay with suspending my disbelief. I'm okay with suspending right. what I believe about the book of Genesis for a good movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just, like, don't call it Noah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Call it, you know, Kevin <laughs> builds a boat. It's just like they, they marketed it they, they, as a marketing ploy under a Christian title in order to have, yeah. you know, and that's a little bit exploitative, I would say. Yeah, I would yeah, say that. I mean, well, and the guy who made the movie is a noted atheist. You know, he he is very, very public in, in most of his interviews that he set out to make a non-biblical Bible movie. And you take something like The the, the uh, Prince of Egypt, you know, was made about 10 years ago, and there you have a movie that was massive artistic license. You know, I mean, most of that story is not found in the Bible, and yet that story really is true to the essence of what the the, the Moses story is. This story is not remotely true to the essence of what right. were the, the essence values and integrity. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. This is a story that uses the same names and the same storyline and absolutely goes the opposite direction. It takes all of God's mercy away mm -hmm. because God is a mindless, vindictive jerk. It paints all of the, the people who are bad as bad because, wait for it, they're literally eating endangered species. That's it. Hmm. That's what they're doing. That's their grave evil. You know, you, you no. never, ever get the sense that these people are really evil. You get the sense that they're human beings living in an ancient time. That's it. And and then suddenly when it looks like the world's going to end and this guy's got an ark, they try to get on it. I mean, that, that, it's just it's absurd that <laughs> that makes them bad you're people. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I think so. They even actually have the rock people or the ants, what have you, actually get to go to heaven because oh. they've drowned people. 
So it's like they're sanctioned by God just to kill oh, for no dude. reason. Oh, dude. Uh. And then, you know, Noah wants to go after his grandchildren. So it sounds to me, it sounds to me like this isn't uh, uh, like The Hobbit, which is a movie based upon J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. This is Noah based upon some guy. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin. Based upon yeah Kevin. 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 This is the kind of blasphemy Monty Python would make, but they'd have the courtesy to do it as a spoof. Right. Whereas these yeah. people are trying to pass it off as the real deal. And unsurprisingly, Christians everywhere are furious mm-hmm. because, I mean, you know, it's it's just nothing at all like the Christian faith. It is a vicious pagan retelling, you know, of something that, you know, was just not even remotely related to the Noah story. So speaking so sad. speaking of vicious pagan retellings, Divergent. So uh, good. Yeah? So I haven't seen good. it yet. I've, well, uh, see, Father Ryan, this is something that you need to understand about Father Ryan. If you've listened to the podcast uh, since episode one, you might have been able to suss this out. Father Ryan speaks in absolutes. <laughs> and when he first saw Divergent, <laughs> he said, it was the most horrible, terrible movie ever made on earth. I wouldn't see it. In fact, I wouldn't even flush the toilet with it using it as a towel. Um, so I said, you know, I might wait. I'll, I'll wait for DVD. <laughs> and then I talked with Father Ryan this week, and he says, it was so good. Wow. <laughs> well, well let, let me defend myself. Yeah, right. I, I didn't say it was the worst movie. I said that as as a an adaptation of the book, it was messy, uh-huh. really, really messy. And I said it was very frustrating, and I was upset, um, and I was very, very, you know, just down in the movie as an adaptation. And and I, I still stand by that. Yeah, but but – uh, over time, I guess, if it, like you said, if you separate it from there are two other books that they're going to have to figure out how they're going to work that in, right. you said it was a good movie. Yeah, as a standalone movie, because I had a chance to talk to some other people, and you know, the people who had not read the book or who had only read book one really enjoyed the movie. And so I, it caused me to step back and say, well, what did they enjoy about it? And as a movie, especially the soundtrack and mostly the set design, it, it created the universe for me. Oh, yeah. and, and that I did enjoy. Hmm. Kathleen, you've seen it too. I loved it. Oh. But I am a girl who gets lost in the story. So I thought it was great. I thought there were some parts that were missing that um, for whatever reason didn't bother me. That they really, I mean, I noticed that they were missing, but they were somewhat huge chunks. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm interested to see how they're going to, because they play a part in the next books. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll be interested to see how they revisit that huge part of the story without having addressed it in the first movie it's going to be a flashback yeah mm. it's going to be a, you didn't see it but this was I happening mean, like yeah. characters were left out is what I, is is oh. really what i'm getting at and mm-hmm. so um I, I thought as a movie if you've never watched the I mean, if you never read the book it was great um if you've read the book you would notice hmm there's some there's something things not, not quite there missing mm-hmm. yeah, which i guess I, Anytime you make a, a screenplay out of a book, it, that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, Mary Kate, did you see uh, Divergent yet, or do you intend to see? It? I, I do intend to see it. I actually haven't seen it, and I haven't read it, so I don't know how uh, much of a you know so bias I'm, I would. You'll have. love the movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing that Father Ryan would suggest uh, that you do not read the book before you see the movie. In this case, bingo, For bingo. Once. All right, cool. Hmm. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, well, I I too have the book uh, downloaded on my, my Kindle, but we're, uh, we're becoming a very bad influence <laughs> on Jeff. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. I do want to read it, but I'm one of those. I uh, I'm like Mary Kate. I'm going to read it first and then go see the movie. Uh, but yeah. I I did see uh, the uh, second Hunger Games movie yeah. last night. Mm-hmm. I watched it. Uh, it? Was, Catching was it? fire. Catching fire. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I um I I liked it, and but I was. You know, I don't want to be a spoiler here, but uh, I know there's more yet to come. But yeah. um, at the end of the movie, they had like a six or eight minute clip of Divergent, and they were oh. talking to uh, the the stars and 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 uh, uh, going through some of the storyline. And they're like, "Wow, I, mm-hmm. I'm ready for it." So did, did, I'll read uh, it first. Did we finally get to see Will's eyebrow crease? Um. We uh, did. Yeah. I mean, they, Will, Will. They talk a lot yeah. about it in the book. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Yeah, but of, of necessity, the relationship between Christina and Will was really more of an afterthought in the movie. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that, I can understand that. That that will be easily dealt with at the beginning of the second movie. Did you find that it was more of the stereotypical, like, you know, Twilight type? Thankfully, no. no. They, they did oh, not cool. waste all the time with the 
uh, let me take off my shirt and show you my abs that have been carefully yeah. painted in by the makeup department. I mean, it was. Now, there was um, the token, the, that token scene, but. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't overdone in any way like most of the other teen flick stuff. It was really treated, the material was really treated as a, as a serious text. Um, and, and it was very good. I mean, it was as good as the second, hung, a second Hunger Games movie was because the first Hunger Games movie was a disaster. The second one really kind of came into its own by doing really good editing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the Divergent movie could have benefited from some more editing uh, and some more restraint. But uh, but all in all, the the universe was created brilliantly, yeah. and uh, and so there are going to be serious plot problems in the next movie yeah. because they've they've made some massive mistakes in casting you know the great villain of the second book as the villain of the first movie. But um, you know, and I'm not spoiling anything because everybody who's read the first four pages of the book knows that. But it's it's just an, it's going to be a mess adapting the second book, but. You know, they've done a good job on the first movie. So, who knows? You know another book that I would like to see treated as a serious text? What's that? The Bible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, And then, of course, there's The Hobbit Part 2, which I haven't seen uh, yet. And I, I fear that it is no longer in the theaters. But, yeah, it's uh, now on DVD. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, but you can purchase it on Blu-ray at your local uh, Maybe I'll just have to turn my speakers up to get the full Benedict Cumberbatch experience. <laughs> I was remarkably, I mean, taken aback and completely shocked as much as I hated the first Hobbit movie. Again, I know I was very casual in my comments about that, but <laughs> it, 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 the second Hobbit movie was really good. You know, whoever it was that wrote with Peter Jackson and got him to, uh, to take all what I'm sure were goofy parts out of The Lord of the Ring. You know, and who did not tell him to take that stupid rabbit scene out of the first Hobbit movie? Um, yeah. You know, apparently he needs to get that person back because there were a couple of other stupid scenes in this one, but <laughs> it was so much better, so much clearer about what it wanted to do. And although the weird, you know, dwarf thing at the end was a bit messy, overall the movie was really well done, and Smaug was amazing. The Ooh. CGI was perfect. Huh. Hey. That's that's Flawless. all I need to know. Yeah, and then quickly uh, some book reviews here. Um, uh, I know that both Father Ryan and I have read Voyage to Alpha Centauri, which is Michael O'Brien's new tome, and a tome it is. And uh, I, I, it's it's a work of science fiction, but it's telling um, basically a a sociological and an, and an anthropological story. And uh, I thought it was really really well done. Uh, it was long. Uh, yep. All of Michael O'Brien's books are long. But it was really masterfully done, and you can kind of tell that Michael O'Brien really likes science fiction. And so this was kind of a stretch for him as he was kind of reaching into the universe of sci-fi to tell a story that is actually a lot older than, uh, than technology or, you know, new, whizzy, shiny technology. The, the thing that's always amazed me about Michael O'Brien's books is when I get to the end of them, I am desperate to meet the character. Like, I would... I would give anything to meet Father Elijah. I would give anything to yeah. meet Pavel, uh, whatever the guy's Karnowski. name is, an island of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, and I would give anything to go and visit this planet on Alpha Centauri. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, just the little short epilogue he wrote, I was thinking I would read a hundred books, you know, Dune style about that, that Ooh. society. Yeah. I mean, I would read it again and again and again and again because it was fascinating. Uh, of course, this book could stand to lose two or three hundred pages, but it was so excellent. And uh, and there were some frustrating parts, but but I solemnly assure anybody who wants to read it, whether you're a sci-fi fan or not, it is an amazing book, and it's very very apropos to what we're experiencing in our world today. Right. And uh, just truly astounding, and and definitely worth your time. And and Michael O'Brien has the ability to just suck you into the universe, as you say. You you yeah. just you almost become, uh, as you're reading it, you almost become like a person sitting in a chair just watching it happen. He really does have that ability, and I would really like to see the, the further adventures of, uh, of the, the Alpha Centauri planet. You know, um, yeah. what do they call it? Nova, right? Yes, Nova. That Nova was Terra. Good. Nova Terra. But did they, didn't they end up, they renamed it to something, something else, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they, they Kevin. did. Yeah, they, they, they yep. renamed it. Kevin, yeah. They, <laughs> Kevin, Bob, yeah. Kevin's, <laughs> Kevin 4. Have you noticed that most of the planets on Star Trek are three, like Nimbus three, uh, ah. Forkus three, uh, yeah, hmm. Shellyac three, Cardassia Prime, but 
three seems, I guess maybe because three is a funny word to say and it, and it rolls all the time. I don't know. You're welcome, sure. Kathleen. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> all righty. You're listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I am Father Chris Decker, joining us via Skype in high definition, Father Ryan Humphreys uh, in Natchitoches. We've also got uh, Jeff Blackwell. Jeff Blackwell is our technical director. We've got Kathleen, who is Googling away Voyage to Alpha Centauri on her computer. (laughs) And uh, Mary-Kate Taylor, who is in the video cave, who is switching the video for us. If it looks good, tell her. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't, well, tell her. Tell no. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. The do-it-yourself revolution, and I think we all know what Pinterest is, uh, has really grown with the internet. Uh, Kathleen, are you a pinner? Uh, I'm, I'm not a pinner. Oh. You're a stalker. Uh, yeah. I, a, I just, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're a Pinterest. <laughs> I, I understand. Because I do that. I, I, don't, I don't actually actively pin things. Although I made something out of colored paper oh. for, for, for a friend. Um, for I saw that. Yeah, yeah uh, Saint yeah. Joseph yeah. And, and and child uh, mm-hmm. and the child Jesus, and they said, "Oh man, you could really open up an Etsy store. You could really, you know, pin on Pinterest with that." And I mm-hmm. said, "Oh, I hadn't really thought about that. I usually just scroll with Pinterest." But yeah. uh, anyway, so as fad diets and fad workouts have fizzled more and more, people are turning to what could be described as hipster or craft workouts that are mostly about body weight resistance. And so we thought because you know, we're all um, hipsters here. No, we're not. Uh, we, we thought maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, about this this the notion of working out and how it's becoming kind of a homebrewed. Is that right? Uh, would you say, Father? I think it's exactly the best way to put it because so many workouts in the in the the fad workouts of the last few years have have been okay. You need to buy this ridiculous band thing, or you know, buy this crazy shaker thing, or or buy this you know two thousand dollar Nordic Track six billion. And yeah, we're gonna- buddy. You know, I mean, and so you had to buy this device or this thing, or in the case of like insanity, you had to buy like 12 DVDs, you know, at a hundred dollars. And now I think a lot of people are looking and going, you know, especially with the success of the paleo diet going, can't we just, you know, use our bodies and can't we just like do pushups and sit ups and stuff like that? The Marines have been doing it for years. Yeah. You know, and I think more and more people are looking and saying, there's got to be a way to do that. And there's quite a lot of systems now, YouTube channels uh, and, and, and other things that are really trying to say, let's get back to the artisanal workout, the artisanal mm. diet. In a certain sense, paleo is the ultimate hipster diet. It is. And uh, we're starting to see a lot of what we could call craft or, or artisanal workouts. And uh, there's a few here in the, in the show notes, but there are really quite, there's a ton of them. Yeah. In fact, uh, I actually, um, I've been kind of looking at some of these. And again, a lot of these things show up on Pinterest. Uh, as, as I'm just trying, cause uh, father and I have busy schedules like most of you do who are listening to us. I mean, you're listening, you might be listening to us at the gym, but I'll bet you're in your car. Uh, and, and I, I've been trying to figure out, okay, what are some of the things? Cause the thing I like about these artisanal workouts is you really can kind of mold them and shape them to whatever your, uh, your schedule is, you know, rather than driving to a gym and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I know Kathleen, have you, have you jumped back on the exercise bandwagon yet? I have. You have? Yeah, my cousin is a, uh, he manages a gym out by LSU. Nice. And he uh, is a personal trainer. Oh. So I go get my personal training on now three days a week. Look it's at, look at you. Excellent. That's great. That's very good. Yeah. yeah. I work out with all the, with all the, um, what do you call them? They're just huge guys. They're huge. I oh, think that's what. Gym rats. Yeah. And, and, and then there's me doing lunges across the floor. <laughs> it's. The it's lunge is my least favorite of all exercises I on earth. I hate it. <laughs> I don't like them. And when I complain, my cousin Robert makes me do them across the gym in front of everyone. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you see, the thing <laughs> about the lunge, I have bad knees, mm-hmm. and I'm convinced that the, the lunge is not good for a bad knee. Uh, yeah, I can go there. You know, I don't I don't know. Uh, Father Ryan, you actually uh, have been doing some of these resistance things too, I think, huh? Yeah, for a while I've been doing a number of uh, of, of systems, one of which is is just called a, it's a core 30-day challenge. It involves push-ups, planks, and uh, what are called plank reaches, mm. and uh, and so I mean that that's been incredibly good just in terms of of keeping my resistance up. And of course, then you need to do cardio in addition to that. Right. And uh, and so the idea with all body weight workouts is you have to start uh, doing a simplified version of the exercise and a small number of reps. 
and then you build up. So you may start with like push-ups, you know, on your your knees, and then you start up with full push-ups. And as you go further, you build up and you build up and you build up and you do more and more push-ups. And maybe you even invert your push-ups. You put your feet on chairs. And so as you you would grow, you you can adjust the resistance using just your body, and you don't need to buy a new fancy toy or anything. You just need to learn the right way to do your basic stuff: push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups. Uh, and then your your basic cardio. You need to run or swim or bike or elliptical or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody else in the studio actively seeking a life of uh, of exercise? Uh, Jeff, I know you stay busy all the time, and just your feet alone. <laughs> just your feet alone, probably. You're talking to me? Yeah. Come on. I'm serious. Like, Look I'm, at this body, <laughs> man. It's a temple. <laughs> it is a temple. It's, it's I haven't taken very hall. good care yeah. of it, but. Yeah, but no, uh, I mean, I, actually, I will bet you probably get a lot of aerobic exercise in with, with your feet, both of them. I'm just... Whatever I'm, you say. <laughs> and it's hard. It really is hard because, actually, even as a priest, I spend a lot of time sitting in a chair typing or sitting yeah, in a chair yeah. uh, editing or things like that. You know? And unfortunately, that's that's kind of the, the, the gist of, uh, of, of my job, too, sitting in front of a computer mm-hmm. all the time. I, and if uh, if I do exercise, it's going to be walking. Something that's uh, we need pretty to get stress, Jeff. Yeah. We need to pool our resources, and we need to get Jeff a uh, one of those desk treadmills. A desk? Oh, have desk you seen them? No. Have you seen those yeah, they're very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, them. it's your work surface. Okay. And then instead of where a floor would be, you uh-huh. got a treadmill, and you wow. walk that. <laughs> you At speed it up. You slow it down. You speed it up again. You walk it. Do you, you stand see? while you do it? You stand while you work. And you walk that. I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, they're also incredibly cost prohibitive. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Well, I, and, I, and wildly dangerous. Yeah. You don't have a natural sense of. Uh, of uh, Whoa. Uh, of so, Jeff, you could become you, a YouTube you start, star well, and it, it, work it's out. It's not the danger when you're typing. Your brain does that pretty easy. It's when you're trying to look at two, three pieces of paper and you're going back and forth, and then you decide to have a, cu- a sip of coffee. Your brain doesn't know how to deal with all oh, that. You just yeah. fall. You yeah. know. <laughs> It's not yeah, good. The whole walking and chewing gum. Well, I've seen this. You, you get the, your privilege of first slamming your face into the desk and oh. then slamming your face into the treadmill. It's, Man. It's, it's fun. And I've seen the pedals on the stand, which I could stick those underneath the desk oh, yeah, and just kind of pedal while I'm yeah. sitting there. But, uh, but uh, no. Uh, now, Mary Kate, is she, she's she's the example <laughs> Sorry, throw of Throw it to her. <laughs> she's, yeah. Yeah, Mary Kate, uh, what, what do you do? Yeah. What do you uh, do? Well, you know, I do a lot of karate and dance and running and stuff. So I, I call it getting back into fighting shape because you know because I used to do karate a lot and you know. and you've been and and you've been Rocky training for yeah a while I have now, the huh? soundtrack going that's on right. in my head and oh, man. it helps yeah. me and she looks like she could uh, you know kick somebody's <laughs> tail that's you for know sure. five foot one it's intimidating you know you see that and you're like yeah no, <laughs> no that yeah. that is intimidating five foot one yeah oh yeah oh yeah terrifying <laughs> down there yeah. break your knees yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, <wow>. go for <laughs> the ankles go for the navel <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, I actually I bought some dumbbells um, a while back, which is cheaper than the gym. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Bought them on Amazon. Amazon Prime shipped them. The uh, UPS guy was really confused as to why <laughs> the box was so heavy. Yes. Um, and and I actually I use a basic workout that I found online, and um, I can't say that I've added any bulk, thankfully. So there's no danger of me becoming a gym rat because I, awesome. I I don't like gyms and I I don't like you know having to buy the next six sizes up. I don't think I'll ever have to worry about that, uh, thankfully. Um, uh, but uh, but I, I can I can just use the weights that are there, and I can go to the local big box store and buy extra weights as... Um, That's as, right. You know, um, and actually, I did do that recently. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe that's good. You all should check out the kettlebell workout. And I, you know, I actually would oh. like to do the kettlebell workout. Really I would, good. yeah. Um, and and the, you can do. They work a lot of the muscle groups at the same time while you're just doing one action, right? For a lot shorter of amount of time. You know? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You might look into it, Kathleen. I might. Yes, indeed. I actually am. I'm running a 5K in May. Oh, oh. oh. you signed up. I haven't started running yet. Girl. I know that's why I'm saying it out loud. I know that's why I'm saying yeah, it out loud. I'm just loud. looking at my watch here. I know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do to tighten up. Yeah. I have a runner's heart, just not a runner's body. <laughs> the way to get both is to do the running. <laughs> so I'm told. Running. Running. The clock is running. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. That's um basically the way I feel about a workout is um can I use my knees after the workout is over and can my pants still fit at the end of the week? That's ah. kind of where I am. Mm, you know? That's a good gauge to have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you know. I like it. 
So, so there it is. Um, well, uh, what we're going to do is um, remind you of who we are, and then we're going to continue the podcast. How does that sound? You are listening to the Catholic Underground. I am Father Chris Decker, and I'm right here in Studio Central. We've got Kathleen Lee, who's sitting uh, to my left, your right, and uh, she's our, our semi-pro faith ninja. Kathleen, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Also got Jeff Blackwell. Jeff Blackwell is uh, our technical director. He, he sits there um, and looks awesome and uses his fingers to make sure the sound sounds good. Yeah. Right. Uh, we've also got Father Ryan Humphreys, who joins us via Skype in Natchitoches. And Mary Kate Taylor, whose voice you hear and uh, and whose presence you feel. All right, so uh, we're we're moving, talking maybe a little bit about about liturgy um, in in the midst of things, because more than a few listeners have um, have have thought or even contacted us asking, why do priests care so much about liturgy and sacred music in particular? In fact, this was the uh, the subject of a Corpus Christi watershed blog. Uh, by pretty much that same title. In fact, the look back at our show notes show a large proportion of stories, as you can imagine, are associated with the liturgy and music uh, as compared to catechesis or social justice or community development in the parish. And uh, and I'll tell you, we we do, Father, we spend a lot of time talking about liturgy. I wonder if it's just because we're priests, but, but um, also because part of understanding the new evangelization and the digital continent uh, comes from understanding how we celebrate the sacraments. It really does. I mean, the the, the article that uh, that kind of prompted me to want to put this in the show notes comes from CatholicVote.com, and it's by a fellow named Steve Skojek, and he writes about, of all people, Jimmy Fallon. Oh, yeah. Um, of Jimmy and, Fallon, and, late night with Jimmy Fallon fame. Yes, of, of, of yes. <laughs> and uh, so Fallon, of course, is, is one of these guys who is not particularly friendly to the Catholic Church. He's not particularly friendly to, to people of faith. Um, and... You know, so in an interview he did, and this the interview itself came out, I think, maybe a month ago, mm-hmm. he noted that he actually wanted to be a priest. And uh, so I was reading this this interview back and forth, and it, Fallon says, quote, I just, I loved the church. I love the idea of it. I love the smell of the incense. I love the feeling you get when you left church. I loved how the, the priest can make people feel this good. I just thought it was, you just, I love the whole idea. My grandfather was very religious. So I used to go to mass with him at 645 in the morning and serve mass. And then he would get some money. If he did a wedding or a funeral, he'd get like five bucks. And so he says, you know, okay, I can make money in this and do this too. Um, and so he thought this was a cool idea. Yeah. And uh, so the next question that gets asked is, well, do you still go to church? And he goes, no, I don't go. And he says, Court, I tried to go back when I was out in LA and I was kind of struggling for a bit. And I went to church for a while, but it's kind of, it's gotten gigantic for me. He says, quote, there's a band, there's a band now. And you got to, you have to hold hands with people through the whole mass. And I don't like doing that. And he goes, you know, I, I mean, I used to like the shaking hands piece, but that was only one time it happened. And he says, I, I want the old way. I want to hang out with, you know, with the nuns. Uh, that was my favorite type of mass with the grotto and just, you know, straight up quote, mass, mass. <laughs> you um, want mass, and, and, mass, man. And, and the article that, that uh, Stojak actually writes is goes, bad liturgy is not a victimless crime. Mm. And uh, and so it, one of the things that a lot of people have asked me as a young priest in a parish is, well, Father, why are you always worried about liturgy? You're always talking about liturgy. You're always talking about sacred music. And, you know, you say, well, none of the other priests have done this. You know, none of the other priests have been so wound up about it. And so why don't you ever shut up about it? <laughs> um, and, and I mean, and the short answer to the question is because it matters more than probably anything else I do as a priest. It matters. Um you know, but but I think even beyond that, even beyond the Jimmy Fallon thing, um, there's a priest named uh, Father Guanella at, at the Corpus Christi Watershed article that where he says basically, uh, Vatican II says, "quote Priests will acquire holiness in their own distinctive way by exercising their functions sincerely and tirelessly in the Spirit of Christ," and uh, you know, and so ultimately, holiness for priests comes from doing the liturgy well. And that's the thing. There's there's a distinction to be made between being a functionary. And doing your function with with beauty and with excellence, right? Yeah, I mean, that, ultimately, every priest is going to have to say mass. He's going to have to hear confessions, and we can do that by doing the bare minimum. I can buy, you know, the cheap vestments for ninety dollars a piece. I can wear purple on Rose Sunday. I can do, you know, anything I want. That's just the simple way out, and that's that's not that that's a bad thing. Sometimes that's the best thing for the good of my parish, but. In a certain sense, if I as a priest am not constantly saying, 
what can I do to give God more glory? What can I do better by God? And, and not just not just broadly, but specifically, what is every little thing? How can I hear confessions better? How can I anoint the sick better? How can I teach better? How can I serve the poor better? And, and then how can I offer mass better? Yeah. And if that's not an essential part of every question, then something's wrong. And at liturgy, there's exactly 6.478 billion things better we can do. You know, and I think that's that's a big part of the reason why you and I, Father, both are are very interested in what can we do better to make mass better? Because, of course, where do we see people and where do people encounter the church? At Sunday mass. At mass. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, Jimmy Fallon's a good a good example of somebody who had a, a very beautiful experience of the mass. And then uh, as as the, the temptation becomes to make mass. Um, well, here, I'm just going to say it as, as the temptation becomes to make mass more about how the people feel and less about our worship of God, you know, then, then this sort of thing happens. I mean, a number of people, uh, they, they turn away from the church, not because, um, not because they don't want to go to church, but I think some perhaps turn away from, from church and maybe even from the faith and the practice of religion, which is actually called forth by our God, uh, because, what I'm getting at church is the same thing that I'm getting uh, at at the the jazz club, you know, mm. or or I'm getting uh, at the coffee shop, or or I'm getting at the psychiatrist's chair, you know. If all I'm getting in the liturgy is is um, something that I can get for, you know, ninety five dollars an hour or three dollars and fifty cents on my charge card, mm-hmm. then why why am I not going to go to the thing that seems more fun? But on the other hand, if if I smell the incense, if I see the liturgical changing of the of the seasons in the same way that I would walk through a park and watch the leaves change, if if I if I enter into clouds of mystery that envelop me, and and that's being done by the priest, it's being done by the sacred ministers, then that is going to keep me there because I'm I'm being ushered into the gates of heaven, even though I'm not quite there yet. I am there. Yeah. You know, and and it's so easy as a priest just to kind of say, well, it's Sunday, you know, and, and I fall into that trap myself. I mean, I know you probably have too, Father, It's because we got busy weeks and then you're like, well, it's Sunday again. And you you perhaps race through the mass and then you're at the end of it and you're going, now, why did I do that? Why why did I do that? And how did that impact my people? And um, I don't know. I, I think uh, this really does jive with me because... My, my parishioners can tell you I care an awful lot about the celebration of the liturgy and celebration of it well. I care an awful lot when the liturgical appointments, uh, the, the antipendia and, and the, um, the ways in which the church is vested don't look good. I care a lot about that. And it's not just because I'm an artist, but because everything we do from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed matters. Yeah. It all matters. There's really no such thing as minutia for the Christian. Yeah. Ever, you know, and and that's and that's part of the thing. And I, now I have a question for the laity, <laughs> because you know we got we got plenty of that. Uh, does this, do, as as a layperson, uh, Jeff, perhaps I'll, I'll throw to you. Okay. All right. Does do you notice this? Does this matter to you? It does very very deeply. Uh, and uh, interesting interestingly enough, uh, Father Ryan, about uh, two weeks ago, I read this article uh, with Jimmy Fallon and. Uh, my heart really ached for him. It's yeah, like, mine too. Because the the Catholic church that I go to mm-hmm. is, uh, and, and thankfully, you know, it, it is about that mystery, the unknown, uh, and that's what um, inspires my faith. Yeah, and uh, to, to keep me focused on practicing yeah. that faith every day, every minute, uh, because we're not guaranteed the next breath. Yeah. So. Um, uh, and and there was a, an article that or a video you sent a link to Father Ryan a few weeks ago uh, about a a and I'm in quotes here Catholic church uh, somewhere up in Michigan and uh, in this um, introductory video it's like look no kneelers and uh, look you know it, it, and I'm like wait a minute wait what are, what are we losing here uh, it's Deacon Sandy it's about <laughs> holiness and and uh, and living that you know, or doing your best as a human being to live that every minute. Yeah, very true. Kathleen, does this does this jive with you? I mean, does it make a difference when you go into a church and you go, I'm this, I'm somewhere different now? Yeah, you know, we're talking about, you know, entering a sacred space. Like, 
um, you know when you go into a church that there's something set apart about this. This is this is a special place, um, and that's what's so beautiful about all the 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 smells and the sights and the mm-hmm. sounds of, of of a Catholic church. You know, and, and going to maybe um, you know my experience with some non-denominational churches. That's personally what I what I missed yeah. about going into their into their sanctuary was, you know it. It was no different than than a conference room. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, we're all about being visible. You know, our our sacraments are a visible sign of a you know and of an invisible reality. Yeah. Um, I need to see that. I need to to be able to enter into a, a space like that. It's so much more helpful to be able to see. You know, uh, if I'm going to enter in a space like that spiritually in my mm-hmm. faith life, you know, time of prayer, time of of liturgy, um, I need to see that. Yeah. It's, it's helpful. Yeah, exactly. In fact, um, I'll put a link in the show notes. There is a Virginia church that is Baptist, but they have adopted the uh, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and the Revised Common Lectionary. And so they basically, they do all of the Anglican um, liturgies, but they are a Baptist church. And so mm-hmm. I think there is something, there is something about us that is hardwired to look towards liturgy and to look towards beauty. You know, and I think even the, the, this Baptist church, they may still do some of the the bands and things like that because it's hard to it's hard to get away from wherever your roots were planted. You know, mm-hmm. but but there is something I can I, and I'm reading in the article uh, that there is something that that is being called forth from the pastor of this parish, who's a young pastor, and uh, and from the people that they really are connecting with, not just a sense of conservatism or tradition or whatever, but that we're really called. To that place that is other, we are really called into the worship of God, and the only place that we can do that is in the tabernacle, in the midst of the column of cloud and the column of fire. And you don't get that necessarily um, if if you're just kind of uh, feeling good with everybody else around you, and that's that's you know, and that's the only experience yeah. you have. So, so yeah, um, I uh, I myself uh, care a lot about the liturgy. I didn't ask you, Mary Kate, but I bet it makes a difference to you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think that the whole physical and spiritual aspect of the sacrament, you know, just coming into fruition, it's just beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And and so um, before we leave the topic, uh, we also want to encourage you to check out a great video in this vein from St. John Cantius Parish in Chicago. The video is called Restoring the Sacred, and it's about the overwhelming growth in a parish uh, that has committed to the reform of the sacred liturgy, and things are growing. We'll put that in the show notes as well, well, it is that time. Uh, it's the time part of the show that we like to call the CU Pick of the Week. And for our first CU Pick of the Week, um, hey, Kathleen, you feeling like it? You feeling like Pick of the yeah, Week? Yeah, I, I'm all about it. Okay, so um, my Pick of the Week this week, and this is a little... She has pre- show and tell. Look at that. I do, look. If you're on the video feed, she's ready it's to go. It's a little preemptive, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the name of the book is St. John Paul the Great. His five loves, and it's by Jason Everett. He, um, Jason Everett, does uh, a lot of chastity speaking for for young people, and um, and it also has a foreword by a Swiss guard who who gives a little bit of his encounter with um, our soon to be saint. And so um, I've read a little bit of it. It's, it talks. It gives a little background of. of Are you underlining? I am. Oh. And see, we're we're having this conversation in in the chat. Like I love. Stuff that I'm just going to read, like Divergent, goes on the Kindle. But stuff I know I'm going to take notes in. Paper. 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 Um, but it talks about, a little bit about his life, and then it goes into um, what Jason, I guess, classifies as his five as his five main loves. Which we are, love lists. Right. Uh, young people, <laughs> human love, the Blessed Sacrament, the Virgin Mary, and the cross. And so I, hmm. I just, I mean, like, this is, like, hot off the press. All right. Um, so I just started reading it, but it's. Excellent. There are a few jealous people in the chat room right now that you have that in your you hands. Just telling you. Need to get it. Go get it. And you can go to um chastityproject.org, um, I believe is where is where you can you can get it. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon as well too. Mm-hmm. But I'm reading it in in preparation. That's Ooh. right. <laughs> With words of Kathleen highlighted in green. Yes, indeed. Very nice. <laughs> we'll have a we'll have a book discussion later this month. <laughs> oh, I might I'm, I might have to get it. Uh, I haven't read any of Jason Everett's stuff. Yeah, it's very good. He writes well. Mm-hmm. Very well. Lovely. Oh, mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, Jeff Blackwell, you have a you have a non literary pick of yeah, the week. Yeah, normally it's an app or a book or a yeah. movie or something, uh, but uh, 
Um, I, I, I got to tell you, I, first of all, when I started Lent, um, I, it, it was, and, and I've done, done pretty well, you know, staying off of sugar. If I stay off of sugar, I just sleep so much better at night. And I mm-hmm. feel better. So um, my, the only exception was my wife and I celebrated our 40th anniversary. Yes, I'm an old guy. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, married to a young woman. Uh, well, at least it, she's at least 40, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, so we had some cake. But um, uh, now beyond that, I, I, um, I'm, I'm looking for like some alternative foods. I'm just kind of like meat and, and, and weeds as, as, as the way a friend of mine puts it. Uh, but, um, I have some other like, uh, health issues, which I've had too much protein then I have other problems. So what I've been trying to do is find something to kind of satisfy that sweet tooth and that, and that it works for me and it, it is satisfying and a little bit goes a long way and it's almond milk. Yeah. Mm. I've tried uh, soy milk. Don't like it. Um, but, uh, the almond milk really hit, um, uh, hit a note. And uh, so it's sort of like my nightcap. So I have a little glass oh. of this, um, um, diamond almond breeze. I call it. I have a low sugar version. It's like 40 calories a cup. And then they have the unsweetened, which is 30 calories, but I just love the taste of it. And the consistency is like milk. Um, but it's got a little hint of a nutty flavor to it and it satisfies me. So I, I, I chose that as my pick of the week. I was going to say, you know, uh, of course you're, you're trying to cut the sugar out, but what happens if you put a little bit of, uh, of amaretto in almond milk? Does it taste like almond almond milk? Well, I haven't tried that, but uh, now that you mention it, I'm going to have to. I might happen to have a little uh, botella de amaretto <laughs> in dark wheat. So, oh, boy. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, hey, I'll come and enjoy a nightcap with you. After. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Who are the, Father Ryan, <laughs> you're next. You think I'm drinking the almond milk here. Huh. Uh, so, so where you go? Well, I'm also going down the beverage route. I'm a big, big fan of fancy tea and even pretentious hipster tea. And there is a new social network devoted to nothing but tea. Did Kevin Rose start this? I think so. It's called (laughs) Steepster. Of course he did. No, I actually think he did. Uh, and it's it's not particularly it's like Goodreads. It's not particularly sophisticated. It's not particularly beautiful, but it lets you, you know, comment to discuss tea. It's like Goodreads for tea, tea. You, you can discover tea you like. You can comment on it. You can review tea. You can read, see other people's reviews. You can see what teas are, are, are uh, what is it called? Um, uh, teas are trending. trending. Yeah. What teas yeah. are trending right now? And this some, some of this stuff is wildly pretentious. It looks very tasty. Um, and so it's, it's for tea drinkers, this is a great, helpful website. If you're not a tea drinker, stop listening to me. But if you are... Go to steepster.com. It is a free uh, service. And they actually do have, by connection, the ability to order the teas that you see, as well as to be part of a tea of the month program, hmm. oh. um, where they will send you like 12 or 14 samples of tea uh, that are very, very tasty and yummy. My brother-in-law just signed up, um, but you don't have to pay anything to be part of the, the, the social network. It's really quite neat. This uh, this this smells like Kevin Rose of Dig dot com fame because mm. uh, he's you know he's a teaophile himself. Yes. Um, very interesting. I'm, I'm I don't I don't drink tea with the veracity that Father Ryan does and the seriousness. But uh, looks that's kind of cool. I like the idea of a of a of a social network devoted to drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, Cause Kathleen. Why uh, hey, because why not? To each their own. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Kathleen. Uh, no, you're Kathleen. I'm <laughs> I, am. <laughs> I did it again, Mary Kate. Mary Kate, uh, since since you now have voice, is there a pick of the week that that you've got? We need to add you back into the rundown now. Yeah, actually, um, have you heard of that uh, thirty days to morning glory? Yeah, oh, the thirty three days. Thirty three days. I mean, yes. Say, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've been saying that at home, and I absolutely love it. It's it's beautiful. Oh, very cool. Beautiful. Uh, as, as you recall, the thirty three days to morning glory is the uh, the De Montfort. Mary in consecration, but in kind of a, a, a new packaging and, and uh, with some new reflections, right? Absolutely, yes. Very exactly. Cool. It's very, very cool. More accessible, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, the demand for consecration is not for the faint of heart. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, it's very um, uh, intense. And mm-hmm. so this kind of softens it just a little bit, I find. Very good. My pick, oh, is it my turn? My, it pick of the turn. Week. Yeah. <laughs> my pick of the week is uh, a podcast that basically does what we do, except uh, they do it on the BBC. Um, it's called Click. And it is on the BBC World Service, but it's also a podcast, and they talk about technology, and uh, and they don't talk about faith as such. 
but uh, but I have been privileged to listen to a couple of the uh, different um, articles, or rather, I should say, episodes that they've had on uh, on how faith impacts the use of technology. And so they do have um, a podcast. Uh, the The BBC is weird because you have to subscribe, of course, to their podcast, or you can download them from the website. But they don't leave them up forever. Oh. So so I think you know you have like a week from the time that the show airs on the World Service. To, uh, to download it. So uh, you can subscribe to it on iTunes. We'll put that link in the show notes for you um, for, uh, for the BBC's Click podcast. All righty. Uh, quickly, Father Ryan, I guess we can, we can make a, another plug for the pilgrimage. It is, um, it is coming up. It is coming up in October. And are there a few seats left? Yeah, you need to. We actually have extended the deadline slightly. We have six seats available um, although I, I've gotten word that I think three of them may be sold. Oh. We might theoretically be able to squeeze some people in. Uh, if it's you're listening to this before May the 1st, you're welcome to call um, or to, uh, to seek information. Uh, there are links that go to direct sign up, but the best way to do it is to get in touch with us at 318-352-3422 or to email backchat at catholicunderground.com. Uh, again, we're going to go to Rome, we're going to go to Assisi, we're going to go to Florence, we're going to go to Orvieto. It will be at the end of October, 20th through 29th. Uh, it's going to be an all-inclusive kind of trip. All you need is spending money and money for uh, lunch every day. And so it's a very, very inexpensive trip, and it's really worth your time. We're going to be doing the Basilican pilgrimage because I'm going as part of the Minor Basilica. So we'll be saying Mass in all four of the major basilicas. We'll be seeing catacombs, the Scavi, the Colosseum, the Trevi Fountain, uh, all the good stuff, as well as drinking lots and lots and lots of limoncello and Orvieto. Uh -huh. And also, you'll be going with Father Ryan and myself. And if you can yeah, imagine, that's a good point. If you can imagine basically living this podcast for 10 days... What? That's exactly Without having going. a nervous breakdown, you're welcome to come along. <laughs> That's right. You're welcome to come along. <laughs> You'll also get to see Father Ryan attempt to say things in Italian, which for me yeah. makes the trip. Totally Body worth <laughs> <laughs> Sono diabetico. I am All a I diabetic. Goes, hey! Hey! You know, it's, it's mostly hand motions with me in Italian. Yeah, it's true. He speaks well with his hands in, in Italy, and they seem to understand. All right, uh, Jeff, uh, we always thank those who, who help us. Indeed we do. Portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That is, in fact, correct. And we always thank you who are listening to us right at this very moment. Uh, you could be doing anything else, right? You could, you, could be, uh, you could be listening to the Bieber. You could be uh, listening. Yeah, I know. Exactly. You could be doing any of that, but you're not. And so we thank you very much for your patronage of our podcast and, uh, and we thank you for your support in prayer and in finance portions. Whoop, no, that's Jeff's spot. For the show notes that accompany this episode and everything else, you can uh, connect with us on Facebook. Uh, CatholicUnderground.com is the place to go. Father Ryan's church is online at MinorBasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It's been my pleasure. Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU. He's the ruling despot at Blackwell Communications Group. Uh, JeffBlackwell.us and on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellis. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure, Father. Kathleen Lee is our faith ninja at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. Mary-Kate Taylor is an evangelist. In her spare time, she steals lunch money from NASA astronauts. Thank you, Mary-Kate. No problem. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. Follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground. We're Faith Gone Digital. And we are faith. We will see. We will see you next time. I messed up my line, but you know. Bye.